Have you ever used a cycle analyst and thought, I don't need all those amazing features, I just want to know my speed. In this video, Justin shows you how to take an existing cycle analyst setup and downgrade it to a super harness without losing pass or regen. The process is a bit involved and requires a V6 base runner or phase runner, but by following this amazing tutorial, you can sacrifice all those statistics and get a modern display, one that looks pretty and makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. I've got in front of me a perfectly functioning e-bike using a version 6 base runner motor controller, a Shengyi geared hub motor in the front, a torque sensing bottom bracket, all of which is controlled by the classic version 3 cycle analyst, which is not only a display but also a control and command center that determines all the electric assist behavior. The throttle, torque sensor, e-brakes all plug into that cycle analyst device. What we're going to do in this video is compare the differences between this cycle analyst based system and Grin's newer kit platform based around our super harness and third party displays. We're actually going to retrofit and convert what was a cycle analyst kit into a super harness kit and show all the steps involved in that process. So in order to do this conversion, you need a few key pieces of hardware. Of course, you need our main line super harness that plugs into the nine pin plug of the motor controller that's not currently used in the cycle analyst based setup. You're also going to need throttle and e-brake connectors to the super harness. Now you can re-terminate the plugs that you have going to your cycle analyst if you have soldering skills, but for most people it'll be simpler to buy one of our already pre-terminated e-brake cutoff sensors or throttles that have the waterproof HiGo Mini B connector on them. You will also need one of our third-party displays. Uh, Grin currently has three options and more of these will be added to our catalog. And finally, last but not least, it will be essential that you have one of the USB to TTL programming cables. Many people have one of these already from when they purchased their kit or other hardware from Grin. But if you don't have one on hand, be sure to add one to your cart when you're buying the super harness and other accessories because you will need to change the parameter settings on the motor controller and the programming cable is the only way to do that. So when it comes to those throttle options, we've got a few choices. There's thumb lever throttles that can install on the left or the right side of your handlebars and are especially handy when you have twist grip shifters. We've also got conventional half twist throttles if you perform more of a twist and go type of action. Uh, these are best suited when you have lever style shifters for changing your gears. Uh, it's difficult to have a twist shifter and a twist throttle. We've also got some more interesting throttles that are especially useful for regen systems, and those are bi-directional throttles. So we have an inexpensive option from Wuxing that twists forwards to accelerate, twists backwards for regen. This works decently well, but it has a pretty limited amount of motion for forwards and regen control, so the sensitivity is maybe not as high as you might want. If you are wanting the absolute premium deluxe throttle, we've also got the dial two-way throttle. This one clamps on the handlebar and has a thumb roller action, is manufactured in the USA and has an exquisite feel to it, but of course it comes with a made in America price tag. There's also a few options available for the brake cutoff sensor. We've got simple digital cutoff sensors terminated with the four pin plug. Uh, those digital cutoff sensors will engage regen when you squeeze the lever and let you modulate the intensity of regen with the throttle. We've also got levers that look almost exactly the same, but give an analog proportional signal. So in that case, as you squeeze the brake lever and pull it further and further in, you get more and more regenerative braking without having to use a throttle in order to modulate that. If you've got a brake that already has great brakes on it and you don't want to switch the brake levers, we've also got two options for retrofit add-ons of the cutoff sensors. If you've got a mechanical brake, the inline cable sensor installs very neatly with the cable housing of the brake and automatically senses the movement of the brake cable when you squeeze and relax the brake lever. And if you've got hydraulic brakes, we've similarly got the magnetic reed switch sensors that secure to the brake housing with zip ties or double-sided tape and involve a magnet that moves away or closer to the pickup sensor and activates regen through that magnetic position. And finally, if your bike has a pass or a torque sensor, it's important that it's a version that's terminated also with a six-pin HIGO plug. Most of the e-rider sensors that we've sold for many years have a HIGO terminated connector that will directly connect to the base center controllers already. But if you have a basic pass sensor, most likely it has a long cable to the cycle analyst and Grin now offers the same style of pass sensors with a HIGO plug instead. This particular bike is using an e-rider torque sensor and we will be able to simply disconnect the extension cable to the cycle analyst and conveniently plug that straight into the base runner motor controller. So 
So in this installation, all of the electrical signal wires followed along the existing brake and shifter cable housings under the down tube of the bicycle. They were bundled up with spiral wrap, leading to a nice and tidy, clean set of lines for the retrofit. So here you can see the original pedal sensor wire went up to the cycle analyst via this extension cable. So we can simply unplug the extension cable. The e-rider sensor will now plug in directly to the six pin plug of the motor controller that previously wasn't being used. If you have a phase runner motor controller that's located further from the torque sensor, you may need a six pin high go extension cable of which we have a number of varieties available from our catalog. So the cycle analysis system that we just removed had all the cables running along the down tube of the bike following the existing brake and shifter housing. We're gonna recreate that exact same wiring strategy with the super harness. The super harness comes with a mounting bracket that attaches to the steer tube of the bike, just like the cycle analyst. So the overall wiring strategy is very similar. The only difference, of course, is that we're now plugging into the nine pin main connection instead of the eight pin cycle analyst connection. So the super harness mounting bracket is made from thin stainless steel sheet metal, and it's designed so that you can actually bend it in the orientation that you want. Because the super harness conveys useful information based on the three LEDs, we recommend mounting it in a way that those LEDs remain visible. Typically, this would be just underneath the handlebar under the stem itself as part of the spacer stack. So at this point, all the hardware is installed and we have to now figure out the tidy way to route the wires and do the connectorization. We have coming up to the handlebar, the three pin throttle plug, a front light, a rear light, the five pin display plug, and the four pin e-brake cutoff plug. All of these are gonna connect to the super harness. In general, any devices attached to the handlebars, we wanna have those cables follow the brake or shifter housing that's already on the bike, wrapped in spiral wrap so that those are using existing lines, and they come up and connect to the super harness from below. At the back side of things, we're gonna follow the down tube to go to the motor controller and for passing the rear light slash brake light cable up to the brake light port. So finally, with the cables run, any excess cable length, in this case, it's mostly my front light cable, as well as all of these connectors can be neatly wrapped in the Velcro sleeve, which we include as part of the Super Harnet kit. And that just conceals that collection of connectors to give, again, a more discreet finish. So it's all the components plugged in and wired together. We should now be able to turn on the system by pressing and holding the power button connected to the display. And sure enough, the display lights up and we see the super harness pulsating in the orange heartbeat, meaning that it's in standby mode and everything's fine. So at this point, if I hit the throttle, you'll see that the motor spins, but we're not getting any display speed showing up. There's no power showing up and our display shows an error 30 message. As well, if I was to actually pedal the bike, none of the pedal sensing or torque sensing would operate either. And that's because this motor controller is configured to run with the cycle analyst, where all of the torque sensing input is coming in from a throttle signal, the output of the CA, and it's not configured in any way to communicate with these third-party displays over the KM5 protocol. So we're now gonna go over the next step in this process, which is configuring the motor controller to now be compatible with the third-party displays and the direct torque sensor connection. So we're now gonna plug in the USB to TTL cable into the back port on the motor controller in order to update the parameters and settings. But before we update the parameters to work with the super harness, we need to check that we're actually running the latest firmware on the motor controller. The super harness and display functionality is only properly flushed out in the version 6.025 and later. Uh, this controller is running 6.023. And so first we have to click update firmware and choose 6.025 or a more recent version if a more recent one's available. And now this will reload the actual firmware from ASI on the motor controller, which fixes some bugs and issues that were present. All the controllers that we sold after about November 2023 will have the 6.025 firmware on them, but devices shipped earlier than that will generally be 6.023. So after it successfully loads the firmware, in order to re-communicate with the device, we have to just turn the power off and then on again because the controller is in a bootloader state. Turn off, turn on. Uh, now it should reconnect. And now when I click on the dev screen and look at the firmware, it's, you can see that it's been upgraded properly to 6.025. So now we wanna load the parameters that make it compatible with the super harness. And we do that through our default parameters option. So load default parameters, controller type, 
And now we choose a version six base runner and we load version six base runner with super harness, hit apply. This will now reconfigure the base runner for communication with the display. Hit save parameters and allow that process to save. Great. So now that we've saved the parameters to communicate with the display, we should no longer see the error 30 message. And when we hit the throttle and run the motor, we should see our speed and our power showing up. But we also want to configure the pedal assist behavior. And that requires opening the pass setup tab, which is a new feature in the version two phase runner software suite. And similar to what we've done with the cycle analyst, we have a set of preloaded defaults for all the torque and pedal sensors supplied by Grin. So to configure the right pedal sensor for the E-Rider T17, which is what's on this bike, we choose load pedal sensor defaults and then pick E-Rider T17. That configures all of the torque sensor, the torque assist mode, number of pulses per revolution. And it also gives a baseline level of assistance. We hit save parameters here. So now we're gonna turn the system on with these new settings saved, uh, screen boots up. And now when I hit the throttle, we can see a power and a speed showing up. So the display is communicating. We no longer have that error 30 message. And while we've got everything connected to a computer here, we're also gonna double check that the controller sees the torque and paddle assist sensor. So that we can do from the dashboard tab. Um, when you have a torque sensor or pedal sensor configured, there's new fields that show up. Here you can see the torque sensor voltage is sitting right at 1.5 volts, and that is the default resting torque for an E-Rider sensor. If I put force on the cranks, we can see that torque signal voltage increasing up to 2 plus 1.9 volts. Um, so we know that the torque signal is working okay. We can also double check the pedal cadence sensor. So there you can see an average pedal speed, which is currently zero RPM. So in order for this system to work, it's gonna have to have a detected pedal cadence. If I now turn the cranks, we see the pedal speed showing 40 RPM, 50 RPM, and that's a reasonably accurate value for the speed at which I was turning that. Great, so now we know all of the hardware is good. The last thing to do is configure how much assist we're getting in each of the assist levels. That is done through the Pass Setup tab. And in the Pass Setup tab, you have three different assist levels, low, medium, and high. But on the displays, you typically have five or even nine assist levels. So those additional values, they're done by interpolating between medium and high or low and medium. We have a table at the bottom here that summarizes the actual assist level and any assist speed limits that you have at five or if you wanna see nine levels of assistance but that's manipulated just by controlling one of these three values. The full details and explanation of that interpolation is covered in detail in the phase owner or base owner user manual. So please refer to the manual if you wanna fine tune the amount of assistance and the speed limits that you have in any of those modes. So now that we've ensured that all the hardware is good, the very last step is to change some of the default settings on the display to match the actual system. So the speed that shows on the display is actually totally independent of the speed that's shown inside the phase runner software suite. And that's because the specific communication protocol doesn't transmit the speed, it transmits how long it takes for a wheel rotation to take place. So in order for the display speed to be accurate, we need to configure the wheel size within the display itself. So that is done by going to wheel. And in this case, we have a 26 inch bike, but we're set up for a 28 inch wheel. So we can click that, toggle it down to 26 inches. And now our speed will be slightly more accurate. Uh, for the battery pack, we select the battery settings and here we choose, it's been configured for a nominal 48 volt battery. We actually have a 36 volt battery for this system. So change that to 36. And those are the two essential ones. Um, so now you can see we're showing a full charge, which 40 and a half volts on a 36 volt battery certainly is. And if I do hit the throttle, we would notice that the maximum speed is going to be a little bit lower. Previously, we were close to 40 kilometers an hour, and now we're at 37 as a result of the smaller wheel size. So finally, with a torque sensing e-bike, usually five assist levels is totally good. If you're running a basic pass assist, you often want a finer level of granularity between each mode. Uh, that can be configured via the assist levels here. With this particular display, we have options for nine, five, or three levels of assistance. Uh, a torque sensor, I find five is most appropriate. 
and other displays let you have intermediate, like six or seven levels of display. That's just a function of the dis specific display. So at this point, the bike is fully converted over to using the same torque sensor that I had with the cycle analyst, but running with a super harness and display. And I have five levels of assist that increase power as I pedal. Woo! So it's not a bad idea while you're still in the mode of setting up and configuring to then ride around for going from the minimum to maximum assist level and just make sure that you're happy with the divisions and granularity and that at maximum assist you're getting the full power that you want from the bike um, and otherwise you should become a happy camper. One downside with a super harness and display like this is that you can't change those settings without a computer setup. So it's not something you can do on the fly like you can with the cycle analyst. You really want to get it right when you're hooked up to a computer because you don't have the option to change that while you're on the road. Woo!